Greetings and welcome back to room 303. We are engaged in the final conversations from Gibran's The Prophet. This is lecture number 25 on pleasure. This will take us back to lecture number 9 on joy and sorrow as well as passage 20 on friendship. Um, this is really one of the oldest philosophic questions, no doubt. Um, is pleasure good or is it bad? And what if I feel guilty about having pleasures and the like? Al Mustafa is going to try to address all of these questions in this brief poem, another genius offering. Our assumptions are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net. Down that left hand side is our playlist. I'm hopeful that you are already um, exposed to our introductory set of comments. And then finally as well, all of the previous uh, lectures we just finished with on prayer. And in some ways it makes sense to move from his comments on prayer to his comments on pleasure. Why? Because for Gibran, everything is always going to be about freedom, saying yes to life. So we're not going to see here uh, a lot of uh, prohibitions against having and enjoying pleasure. We're going to be back to word pictures of trees and fruit. You'll remember in earlier poems, the tree gives the fruit and doesn't ask for anything in return. We're also going to enjoin that Hindu notion of the chakras and the seven sisters, as he will call it, that tantra idea, that energy is always going to be central to the way that we think. Uh, of course, we'll um, know that the seventh chakra is the crown of the head. We'll maybe have uh, more to say about that as well. In some ways, this is proof of the way in which Gibran, as this religious integralist, is trying to bring together traditions like Christian and Hindu. Um, the goal, of course, for Gibran, this won't shock us when we say this, is always going to be mindfulness and obviously evolution. Progression, right? Then a hermit, and that's significant that the hermit is the one that stays away from worldly pleasures and yet has the courage, we might argue, to try and at least see if he can learn something about the very thing he seeks to avoid. In the very end of the prophet, in the farewell speech, um, Al-Mustafa will in fact say that he was kind of a hermit of a type. He stayed away often from others. Then a hermit who visited the city once a year came forth and said, Speak to us of pleasure. And he answered saying, now, notice that it is, it is not construction, and we're going to see this at least nine times. Watch this. He says it this way. Pleasure is a freedom song. Again, it's always going to come back to spiritual freedom. But it's not freedom, right? It is the blossoming of your desires, pleasure, but it's not their fruit. It's a depth calling unto a height, but it's not the deep nor the height. It is the caged taking wing. We think, obviously, of my Angelos, the caged bird, huh? But it is not space encompassed. Uh, in very truth, pleasure is a freedom song. So, notice the first part of this is a little poem where, kind of following a certain type of tradition in theology, whether it be Christian theology or Hindu theology, we're going to go through negation theory, right? In other words, negation, what it is not, what it is not. Freedom is not this, freedom is not that. And he says it this way, and I fain would have you sing it with fullness of heart, yet I would not have you lose your hearts in the singing. In other words, as we've said before, Gibran is always about you're as free as you allow yourselves to be. There's always going to be freedom balanced with an understanding of others' freedoms. In other words, a certain kind of discipline as well. And that's where he goes. Some of your youth, now he's going to talk about you guys. Some of your youth seek pleasure as if it were all. And they are judged and rebuked. Obviously, you can smile when you hear this. In other words, when you're young, you think pleasure is being able to do whatever makes you feel great. And for that feeling of wanting wanting that pleasure, you are often judged and rebuked. I would not judge nor rebuke them. I would have them seek. Now, some have said this is one of the more important lines in all of the prophet. Two things. Notice, he doesn't condemn the young for wanting pleasure, but what he says is you have to seek in your life. And that seeking is obviously clearly the, the heart of, of the whole project of the prophet, right? He says, for they shall find pleasure, the youth, but not her alone. And then he'll go to the chakras. Seven are her sisters, and the least of them is more beautiful than pleasure. And you'll remember the chakras beginning at one, the root chakra, the pelvis, 
Um, and then the second is the abdomen, the sacral. Uh, the, uh, um, and then the third is above the navel, below the ribs, the solar plexus chakra. The fourth is the heart. The fifth is the throat. The sixth is often referred to as that third eye, the brow area. And then finally, of course, as we said, the seventh is the crown of the head. He says all of these are more, as he says, beautiful than pleasure. And then he asks, notice these rhetorical questions again, right? Have you not heard of the man who was digging in the earth for roots and found a treasure? This will take us, obviously, to the uh, Matthew 13, 45, 46, Pearl of Great Price story. And now he goes, some of your elders, notice we go from the young to the old. Some of your elders remember pleasures with regret, like wrongs committed in drunkenness. In other words, when you're young, he says, you just kind of enjoy pleasure. When you get older, then you start to become more reflective. Kind of think about what Wordsworth says in Ten Turn Abbey about that time has passed in all its aching sorrows are now no more, and all this dizzy raptures when you're young, you're like a top, just spinning, spinning. When you get older, he says, older people, we kind of have a tendency to remember pleasures, but with some sense of regret, of wrongs committed, almost like in drunkenness. But he says it this way, regret is the beclouding of the mind and not its chastisement. Now this is significant. He says, you shouldn't live your life with regrets or with shame, of the past because it will be cloud your mind and keep you from the actual seeking that is of greatest import. He says to the older, they should remember their pleasures, remember now being used twice, with gratitude. This won't shock us that gratitude is more important than regrets as they would the harvest of a summer. He always seems to come back to these kinds of natural word pictures in this case of course harvesting a field. Yet and then there's this interesting line, which tells us that he, he's not judgmental. He's a fallibilist in this regards, as we talked about it. He's going to make the argument, you should have some grace. Watch this. Yet if it comforts them, the older, to regret, let them be comforted. In other words, if you feel a strong sense as you get older, I regret certain pleasures I sought after, and then I, you know, I either got them or I did not get them. Maybe I wasted so much of my time. If that, if that kind of regret makes you comforted, then fine, do it. But you kind of get a sense of the irony of this line. Let's try and live our lives without a lot of regrets, is his point. And then he says it this way. There are among you those who are neither young to seek nor old to remember. And this would obviously be a whole bunch of the demographic that is asking him questions and the like. And in their fear of seeking and remembering, they shun all pleasures lest they neglect the spirit or offend against it. But even in their foregoing is their pleasure. This is a keen insight, right? We've seen this when we study, for example, monks or whoever would, ascetics that would ever try and go away from ever having any pleasures. In the process, there is still a sense of pleasure. And thus, they too find a treasure, a favorite word, obviously, of Gibran, though they dig for roots with quivering hands. But tell me, back to rhetorical questions, who is he that can offend the spirit? Now, this will always go back for Gibran to a fundamental core, romantic, some have called it, principle, that in the end, we are fundamentally good, and therefore we cannot hurt our fundamental spirit. Of course, the Hindu picture is a, is a light bulb covered in mud. The light can come on the light bulb, but you can't see any light because it's covered in mud. But there's still light there. Remove the mud, the light would shine, in other words. Shall the nightingale offend the stillness of the night, or the firefly, the stars, and shall your flame or your smoke burden the wind? Think you the spirit is a still pool which you can trouble with a staff. In other words, this is a way for him to alleviate a lot of, what would we say, sh shame, regret, by saying, you can't harm the spirit that is fundamentally you by seeking after a few pleasures and then maybe failing to achieve or understand or to seek the true, the true meaning of life. It, it's it's going to be okay, guys, is what he's saying here. And then he says it this way, and think about um, the idea of Freud's sublimation as he plays it out, out in civil, civilization and its discontents. Oftentimes, in denying yourselves pleasure, you do but store the desire in the recesses of your being, push down the desire, and of course it always seems to manifest itself sometime later. Who knows? But that which seems omitted today waits for tomorrow. Pure, pure Freud, right? Even your body knows its heritage and its rightful need and will not be deceived. And your body is the harp 
of your soul. This will, of course, take us to Song of Myself 48, Whitman's Song of Myself 48. I think a passage that was very influential in Gibran's thinking. Um, I, he says that I have said that the soul is not more than the body, and I have said that the body is not more than the soul, and nothing not God is greater to one than oneself is. You, um, we've given full lectures at LearnStrong.net if you want to run that to ground in our talks with Walt lectures. And your body is the harp of your soul, and it is yours to bring forth sweet music from it, or confused sounds. Everything, again, is always about harmonics and harmony and equilibrium, right? And in the end, what does he say? You really can't deceive yourself, even though you think you are deceiving yourself. You're really not. And now, to finish, you ask in your heart, how shall we distinguish that which is good in pleasure from that which is not good? This takes us back to, to lecture 23 on good and evil. Obviously, it takes us to Plato's Republic and the question of discrimination, as he calls it, as the key of all education. And then he uses the these natural, back to nature, natural kinds of arguments, and it's brilliant. Go to your fields and your gardens, and you shall learn that it is the pleasure of the bee to gather honey of the flower. But it's also the pleasure of the flower to yield its honey to the bee. You'll remember that we saw this as well in Lecture 20 on Friendship, the symbiotic nature, right? Both the bee and the flower have a reason to coexist. For to the bee, a flower is a fountain of life. And to the flower, a bee is a messenger of love. And to both, bee and flower, the giving and the receiving of pleasure is a need and an ecstasy. And then I'll finish. People of Orphosi, be in your pleasures like the flowers and the bees. In other words, what are we going to say a two-way? It's always about balance. It's always about harmony. It's always about longing for that equilibrium, spiritually speaking. At uh, to be, I love the repetitions. Just go back and circle all the word not, the, all the times not gets used, at least nine of them. And I think it's significant the way he builds the argument. Notice in this, he tells us less about what pleasure is and more what pleasure is not in the end, right? At 3a, I love to think about Voltaire's Candide, that final line, we must cultivate our own garden. Um, we mentioned the Matthew 13, 45 to 46 Pearl of Great Price story. I'd like to think about Dante's Inferno, the Divine Commedia, for just a moment. Think about the Inferno especially as a mechanism of analyzing how Dante perceives pleasures. In other words, to seek after something, to be so en engrossed in it, that it consumes you and it does not lead to your beautification. Go back to our lectures. We've given them fully at, at LearnStrong.net over the Divine Comedia. You're trapped. You're trapped in a certain kind of hell, right? And you, from that, it's hard to get out. And we mentioned Wordsworth, Ten Turn Abbey, those lofty thoughts as he sometimes talks about it, that sense of present pleasure. And so he says what? I dare to hope, though change no doubt from what I was when first I came among these hills. Finally, at 3B, what was a time in your life when you experienced true pleasure? And notice how the idea of experiencing true pleasure changes over time. Isn't that fascinating? And to what degree are you experiencing pleasure as you are working through these poems over the prophet? I hope that that's the case from pleasure. It makes brilliant sense then to move on to beauty. Come back and we'll work that. Thank you.